Thank you, Lad. So next up is Allison Meadow here from the Institute of the Environment and the School of Natural Resources and the Environment. Hi. Uh, thanks, Dan. And uh, I feel like um, Dan gave a little preview of this already. Um, the project that we are going to um, kick off here any day now, basically, is um, what we're calling Community Climate Profiles to Support Adaptation Planning. Um, you just heard this is a great setup. Thanks, Keith. No, thanks, Lad, for going first. Okay, communities have do all kinds of planning for the future, um, and they and that requires decision makers to make reasonable assumptions about our future conditions. Um, communities are already making assumptions and projections about economic trends, demographic trends, geographic trends, how cities are growing, environmental quality, hazards. The thing is. They've got expertise to do this already. They have planners, they have demographers, they've got economists. Um, they're, they're used to doing this. They're revising, updating general plans every 15 and 20 years. They're doing sector plans, like transportation plans, green infrastructure plans, much more, much more often. They have the expertise to handle those kinds of assumptions and plans. What we are running into is that planning for climate change, as many of us in this room know, adds this whole new dimension to community planning efforts. Um, the climate and environment might be very different the next time a general plan is written. If we're talking about a 15 to 20 year time step between when you're writing a general plan, all of a sudden you're working into, wow, we think that things are changing and things are changing on that time scale. Um, communities are already experiencing impacts. We're seeing the heat, we're seeing the stress, we're seeing uh, floodplains change because storm, you know, storm, uh, storm intensity is changing. Problem is that most communities do not have a climate scientist on staff, and there are only so many Dave Dubois to go around. <laughs> <laughs> or Mike Kermans. I mean, there's just not enough of us, right? <laughs> um, so we have run into these, these, this pattern over and over again. Communities um, may totally lack climate and climate change information. They just don't have any idea how to get started. Or maybe they can get some of the publicly accessible data, but they don't have um, the ability to interpret that and really understand, okay, if I'm getting these regional scale projections, what does that mean for me here in the city of Tucson or in Las Cruces or whatever? What does that really mean for my city? Or it's not the right scale at all. Um, you know, regional scale projections that include State of California have some limitations when you're, you know, here deep in the desert. Um, the uncertainties in climate information are really perceived as a barrier. You guys don't know what, you know, you can't tell me for sure what's going to happen, so why should I bother planning for it? Because we don't know. Um, and then all of us in this room know that the information on these graphs are, this is credible, this is salient, we know it's useful. They are incredibly hard to explain. They are incredibly hard to understand unless you have the, you know, the solid background in climate science. And so these are some of the barriers in all of us. And the cleanest community kind of know this already, that, that, that these are the kinds of things that we're facing um, in trying to help communities make these plans for climate change. So our idea is to create these community climate profiles. Take climate information, historic and instrumental records, climate change impacts, climate projections, and tailor those as best as possible to community level decisions. It's our effort to lower the barrier of what is often the very first step when you go read those climate um, adaptation planning guides. That first step is always identify climate and non climate uh, stressors or collect and review all the climate information. And that for a lot of communities is where they stop because they go, how? One, for all of those reasons that I just said before. Um, so these are little quotes from a couple of different planning guides. Um, and so our idea is um, to act very much in the knowledge broker role in this project in a, in a really direct way. We can compile and interpret the climate information and the climate impacts information and deliver it in what we hope will be a really accessible format for cities, tailor it to the decisions that they're making at the scales that they're making. Um, it's still a really iterative and engaged process. We need lots of um, community input and we need lots of feedback, um, but ultimately we're going to do the work because we're identifying as a barrier the lack of capacity within a lot of, of communities to do it themselves. 
Um, we are including in these um, summaries of historical and instrumental temperature and precipitation, which also allows us to talk a little bit about climate trends, see our trends of heat. Um, Explanations of any key climate phenomenon. Um, you know, is there something that goes on on a regular basis? How does ENSO affect your region, your community? Kind of explain some of that. Um, provide those projection data at a, again at a scale that people can kind of grapple with. So we're right now finding that state level scale seems to be enough. It's small enough. People kind of get their heads around it, but it's not so small that um, we send the wrong message about, you know, oh, if you just downscale it, you get all the right answers. We want to explain that. Um, and then providing a summary of general but likely climate impacts in, um, in a given area. Um, we really want to make sure that we are including those explanations. Where did we get the data? How do we do the, how do we do, um, the analysis? Because one of the goals is really to sort of boost climate literacy and to stop black boxing a lot of this stuff. So bring the communities into these conversations so that they're understanding, oh, okay, I, you know, build trust in the data by explaining how and what we're doing with it. Um, our outreach to communities is, um, we're going to build on connections that we already have with southwestern communities. Uh, once we have a few of these profiles that we can take out, we can feel like we can sort of market ourselves. <laughs> I can produce one of these for you. Um, and then partnerships with other institutions as part of um, ongoing or larger planning efforts. Um, you know, our target is going to be communities where um, we sort of already know they don't have a lot of capacity. State of California, for example. We're not going to work with the state of California. They've got plenty of money and <laughs> they can do this. But we do know that um, particularly small to mid-sized communities in the Southwest just don't have the capacity to do this. So this is a place that we can come in and just fill in that gap in the, you know, in the short term, hopefully. Um, and also we can focus on, <coughs> um, on departments within a, you know, within a municipality, within a tribe, um, if, you know, if, if somebody's in the middle of an ongoing planning effort and could use this, but it's a particular sector, we're open to do that as well. It doesn't all have to be easy scale. Um, our process will be um, sending out kind of a scoping survey. We've developed some questions that we feel like get the conversation going and are specific enough to give us something to go on in terms of Who's the intended audience for the profile? Some people it might be, I gotta get my city council to understand what's going on, or no, I definitely need this climate data to put into the general plan. Two different audiences, we're gonna have to tailor that information a little bit differently. What the community's concerns are about climate change, what kinds of questions they're hearing from either their community members, decision makers, um, specific resources, you know, if a community is dealing, for example, with, you know, an Endangered Species Act situation or they've got water rights concerns, um, we want to know about that because then we can, you know, we can focus and we can, and we can tailor the information a little bit. Um, we have to have a joint meeting after that to say, great, we got your questions, we know what your concerns are, here's what we're able to bring to the table and kind of negotiate and come to an understanding about this is going to be the scope of, of this particular report then we can take all that information and go back and we've got Lad, we've got Jeremy and Sarah isn't here today, but Sarah Leroy is working on this. The four of us can, can go back to our little uh, offices um, and generate the information that, that we know is gonna be useful. A lot of back and forth with the community on the, what that final product looks like. I'm finding that is um, helpful, but time consuming. Um, and then um, making sure that the final document is the property of the community. This is particularly important if we're working with tribes um, and we would like to continue to work with tribes when it comes to any data information about, um, about a tribal nation. We want to make sure that, that, that the, we're sending a clear message. We did the work. It's yours to do with what you will. We'd like to request the possibility of being able to share that with others, but um, if anybody doesn't want to in a tribal community, and you know, maybe that's a tribal sovereignty issue, and we just say that's fine. Um, in other communities, maybe it's becoming a bit of a competitive, you know, we don't want to tip our hand about what we're doing or, you know, or possible impacts, and we say, that's great, it's yours. Um, we're building in some evaluation into this that I think will help our project and, and hopefully um, claim us more, more broadly. I mentioned we've got these scoping questions and we can be collecting data about um, 
about community needs. We want to build a database about that so that we're sort of systematically collecting some of that information in a way that helps us understand what the big concerns are and maybe helps all of you guys understand what the big concerns are in the region. We're also going to institute follow-up surveys, interviews, or discussions about how did this work? How did this profile work for you? How did you end up using it? What were some of the stumbling blocks so that we can feed that back into our process going on? Um, as Dan mentioned, we were fortunate enough over the last couple of years to have funding from the Howard Program in Environment and Social Justice, which came through the Native Nations Climate Adaptation Program, and we did some pilots um, of similar documents with four tribes, I'm just displaying three because one's still sort of sitting in draft form, um, which was really helpful in figuring out how all of this works. Some of our lessons, the demand is real. Communities want this information, they need this information. More and more people are starting to make these plans for adaptation planning, um, and they want this information, um, and we are a source of that. The impacts information is really the key. Um, we tried it with just sort of handing over climate information, and it was like everybody said, that's great, now tell me what's gonna happen. And so we had to really refine our process and say, okay, impacts is the way to go. We need to present the climate information, but we really do need to provide that background on. And this is what it most likely or, or is likely to mean for you. Climate extremes are a big one that people are asking more and more about. We did not have a lot of capacity to tackle that in this pilot rounds, but um, we're hoping um, to do more of that. Uh, dust storms have been one of the big questions that we get. Heat waves, um, stream flow, water shortages, particularly cap water shortages, snowpack and stream flow, how that's going to affect water um, in different communities. Um, Writing for community use is really hard, even when you've got practice, and we're learning more and more every time we do it, but it's hard, and it takes a lot of time and effort. Um, that was one of my big lessons. Um, communities want more than our current resources can fulfill. This could be a never-ending, infinite project that goes on for years and years with any one particular community. So that process of really defining this is what we are able to do with the resources that we have available to us it becomes really important for setting a good tone so that nobody is disappointed or expectations are not met. Um, but what we hope is that maybe these profiles can be a jumping off point for longer term, <coughs> more intensive collaborations with communities going forward. If we can sort of build some trust and build some connections, like we were able to deliver this for you, do you want to partner on something like a full-scale adaptation plan. Maybe that's something that can grow out of this down the road with more money. <laughs> um, and our next steps, yay. Um, we already, um, we are about to launch a partnership with the City of Flagstaff that is happening in collaboration with Cascadia Consulting as part of Flagstaff's Climate and Adaptation Action Plan. So we're going to generate the background climate and some of the impacts data for that plan. Um, we have ongoing relationship and partnership with Tom Optum, um, Office of Emergency Management. They're particularly interested in storm trends um, and its impact on hazards. So we're going to do some, um, some work with them. And um, through Sarah Leroy and some of the previous work going on in New Mexico, we've got some good connections with New Mexico Department of Homeland Security. And so we're going to um, explore that down the road as well. So that's actually it, except that I do just want to, again, acknowledge that we had pilot funding for this from the Howard program and uh, with some support from NCAP, and um, that has really given us a huge leg up on this project. Thanks. Thanks, Allison. <laughs> of the three sites that you've already developed the profile for, do you have any, like, any anecdotal stories about you know yeah. how they used it or I kind of um, I kind of skipped because I was worried about running out of time but Dan and I wrote up a short um, a short reflection piece short description piece um, uh, this spring, spring issue of rural in connections. rural connections and there's some copies of that floating around because I just floated them around the building the other day when I was cleaning my office um, where um, 
We do have, yeah, so we have heard, yes, this has been really helpful. I plan to use this in an adaptation plan or in this process going forward. I know um, for Gila River Indian community, we, we, we're still refining that final document, but they are launched into their adaptation planning process. We've been talking with the group that is writing their adaptation plan, so we're really looped in with that. So I know for sure that that is the basis of their adaptation plan. Um, so that's been really helpful. Um, and Fort McDowell, Yavapai Nation, same thing. That, that's their intention, is to use this to launch um, some larger scale planning efforts. So yeah, we are hearing that, yes, it is doing what we were hoping that it would do. That's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> Other questions for Allison? So um, do you, uh, when you do the historical analysis, do you incorporate um, like the tribal knowledge into that, or do you just use? Uh, we do not have the capacity in this project to do that kind of level of, of work. That um, that just requires a lot more community engagement and a lot more time with the community and trust building than we are capable of doing for this project. Um, again, that's a place where if we already have some you know existing relationships or we perhaps develop something more long term, I, I think it would be amazing to incorporate that. But it's one of the things with all of the groups that we've worked with, we just had to say, this is what we are, you know, this is what we can deliver. And, and I like to be upfront and say, I know that that's only one small piece. Um, and, and we can talk about larger scale stuff going forward. But it's just not possible on the resources we have. Last question, Erica. Okay. Um, are the communities interested in the health impacts, or do they see the health impacts as a co-benefit of their planning efforts? Um, people are talking about what are the health impacts of climate change. Um, and so if uh, you guys are open to it, we would love to um, start talking with you when we get those kinds of questions. Yes. Um, we've already used some of the work that came out recently about Zika and West Nile and those projections because people are specifically asking about those kinds of things. It's so, actually been a client of your brace report. Yes. <laughs> yes, the race reports have been really helpful. So yes, and I would love to pull more goodness people. Into one more, because I think oh, Ben, ben maybe has one Yeah, I had one oh. online. Uh, Sean asks, are communities looking to create adaptation plans as standalone documents? Are they looking for advice how climate relates to the ordinary suite of community plans, hazard mitigation plans, comprehensive plans? So a simple little question. What type of plans are you seeing as most relevant, I think, is the... the um, so far, I mean, again, we have a small sample, and equals three. Um, <laughs> and um, of those, two of them were looking at specifically at climate adaptation plans. And I don't know, because I'm not specifically involved in that planning process, the extent to which that may be mainstreamed. The other group that we worked with um, in, um, in Nevada, my impression was that, that, was gonna, that, the, that the climate information was going to feed more into some general environmental and community planning efforts. Um, I mean, I have many, many thoughts on which is most relevant and, and which is most helpful in the scope of this project. Um, I, it's not my decision to make, basically, this is the, the take I have to, <laughs> to give. All right, thanks, Allison.